Okie dokie. So, I wanted to kick us off. Obviously, today is on treasure, money, stuff, my things. But uh, I've been shifting the titles week to week. I picked abundantly provided for today. I also debated perfectly secure as another title. But why do you think a lesson on the kingdom of God's perspective on money or treasure or things, why should we title it abundantly provided for? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, sometimes I struggle with that. I think like honestly because we live in the United States and I guess like I've never lived like in the I mean when we were growing up we had food stamps. Yeah. For a little while. But still that was pretty like, um, but when you go to a different country, sometimes you see people who are starving and like that part is hard, you know, like we're provided I feel like all of our needs here like our physical needs are Yeah. We may get into that. It wasn't necessarily part of the topic. No, it's great. Um, yeah, I think our money, our stuff, has a lot to do with whether we feel secure, provided for, in need, plenty. So what we're going to talk about today kind of hits on that nerve, so to say, of your feeling of having enough, feeling like you're secure and provided for, and God's perspective, um, I would hope that we can have an abundant mentality about our things. So kind of going through this whole series again is this idea that Jesus came to give us that we may have life and have it abundantly. And that's not through, if we're looking at time, talent, treasure, it's not, man, if I wanted abundant time, imagine if I just had 30 hours in a day, we would probably end up just spending those extra six hours on another, you know, le class or work, or we would probably fill it and just have as, as full of a life <laughs> as we have now with more time. Same with talent. If we were just more gifted and talented, would we actually feel like we're enough? Or would we be measuring ourselves against a bigger pond, <laughs> a big fish in a small pond idea, right? Get more talented. Now you're in a bigger pond. and <laughs> Maybe you wouldn't find that fulfillment. And same with our money, right? We can have more money, but when is it enough? When would you actually feel secure? When would you actually feel provided for? Because these are kind of the themes of this entire process. So Going th back through the whole class, class one is this concept of whose kingdom are we in? Whose authority are we under? What realm? Um, every realm has laws, rules, and we are going to be subject to something. We are not the kings of the world, so either we view it through a worldly point of view, and we purely look at right here where we are in America and we are subject to those rules and authority or we shift and say, hey, we're, we're citizens of heaven. What's God's kingdom and what does it mean to be in his kingdom? So if we're looking at time, if you remember, we talked a lot, at least in this class, again, we could do a whole four series on time or a whole four series on talent, but we talked about presence and attention, our conscious awareness our priorities and our focus. That's kind of what we lumped into the concept of time. And we, we talked about the difference between literal time that's passing and the finite amount of time that each of us have versus our experience of time. Some things seem to last forever and they don't take a lot of time. Things seem to go by really quickly, but it's all to do with where we're setting our attention where our presence is. 
So there's a difference between that. We looked at rhythms, how God gave Israel these patterns in those festivals to show them and, and physiologically or like experientially with their senses allow them to have an experience of time that was different. Um, and there was this theme of trust, right? I could work myself to death, never have enough. Or this concept of Sabbath, which was a pretty central thing we talked about. There was ceasing from all ordinary work in many of these celebrations, not just the weekly Sabbath, but then the year of Jubilee, the Sabbath year. And again, this is central, this trust. Do I work longer? We talked even about like Chick-fil-A. <laughs> They're not 24-7 and they have, you know, Sundays off or a 24-7 restaurant next to them. And if Chick-fil-A is making more money, what if Chick-fil-A stayed open? You know, there's kind of this paradigm of like, and again, not using it as a scriptural example, but the reality that a restaurant in our physical world can be more productive in less time is fascinating. And for us, are we really going to gain more by working that extra day? Or if we trust God and let go, will he provide? And then last week, we talked about talent. We spent a lot of time on finding your purpose. This concept of purpose, the reason for which something is done or created and for which something exists. So for each of us, for each of you, the reason for which you were created, the reason for which you exist, right? Do we know what that is? And instead of getting into, what's my job supposed to be? And where should I spend my time? Or how do I use my, my talents or gifts? We talked a lot about, instead of this idea of my purpose or my gift to the world, and asking what's my purpose. We looked at what's God's purpose for me. Instead of what's my gift to the world, I own it. This is my gift. We are God's gift to the world for his redemptive purpose. So instead of am I the master of my purpose or am I a part of the master's greater purpose? We find a our purpose playing a role in a bigger plan. And the reality is, whether, I don't remember if we talked about this last week or not, but if you're watching a movie, the more grander the conflict, the bigger the thing, the whole universe is at stake, tends to be a much more exciting story. And for us, we can choose to live our little purpose within our tiny little realm of influence or we can join God's plan in this grander, greater story to redeem the whole world and bring heaven on earth. Much more exciting life, in my opinion. So um, we want to look at, let's not make a plan and say, follow me, God, but actually follow God. So you're seeing a lot of these themes, and today, treasure... We're going to talk about your stuff, your resources, your money. Where do you find your source of security and provision? So that's a question to ask yourself. Look at your life right now. If you think about where does my security come from? Where is my provision? What's the primary source? That's probably changed over your lifetime. Many of us had parents that provided, and our primary source of that provision and security was that relationship with our parents. Others had a very insecure childhood. I was hanging out with someone on Friday that felt like since he was 11, he was on his own, right? He was his source of provision. Other people get married, and their spouse is a big part of that. Sometimes if you're a wealthy family, even long after, I have a friend from high school Actually, one of my classmates in high school was part of this family, too. But one of my friends from high school, I just found this out in January, married into the C family. There's this brand of, of uh, malls in the Philippines called Shoe Mart SM. 
So one of my buddies, well, not, uh, he was like three or four years younger than me, one of my schoolmates is now married into a billionaire family. He is, I don't know what he does anymore or what, you know, but I was like, oh, he married one of their daughters? Um, I had a, a Bible project with one of their other daughters when I was growing up. I was like, dang, that girl over there is worth, <laughs> how, you know, like that level of provision and security. Imagine marrying into a family like that. Where would your source of security and provision come from? So that's kind of the big question we want to tackle today because there is a literal source of where our money comes from. For us, sometimes we have a lot of security in our job. Right now, with some changes in the economy, a few years ago with the changes with COVID, we realized how stable or unstable our source of security and provision was. Many people lost all of that in an instant, right? When I was in a career, well, I am still in that same career, but my primary source of gaining clients was doing in-person meetings. So March 2020 hit, and our whole company was like, what are we going to do? And we learned how to do virtual meetings, but that whole concept of provision and security crumbled in an instant. So that's what we want to tackle today. And we're going to be talking about this ownership versus stewardship, which I think is pretty central when we talk about something physical, because we talked a little bit about owning my time and if it's my time or my lane on the freeway and someone gets in my way, I get frustrated, bitter, annoyed. Um, talents, it's harder to visualize, but the physical representations of ownership, so it's my iPad, my computer, those are easier things to see this difference. Kids playing, having a grand time until one of the kids decides, mine, and then literally all hell breaks loose. And I think it's similar for us. We're playing about on this little earth, and once we decide this is mine, same as in the first class we talked about where priests or many temples, if there's this God space in our space and and we have this ability to help people interact with God, right? We connect people, bring heaven on earth kind of concept. The mind almost is bringing hell on earth, right? This bitterness, anger, frustration. So when we focus on mine, we're creating hell on earth for me and those around me. And the more that we see things as a gift, the more freedom and security and abundance we have. So another way to look at this, the ownership versus stewardship, if we get really central to a lot of what's here, <laughs> if you ever read Paul's letters and how he starts them, he always introduces himself a certain way. Do you guys know this pattern? And Paul says, I am Paul blank. What does he say? Just open up to a New Testament epistle and read the first line. It'll say it every single time. Bond servant. Literally, it would mean slave, right? So when you introduce yourself in a letter, <laughs> if someone reads your LinkedIn profile, we, we introduce ourselves certain ways. There's priorities. Ah, check me out. I'm podcast host of The Gathering Church. I put that on my LinkedIn. That's pretty important, right? Paul, who, man, he accomplished a lot. He introduced himself. I am a bondservant. I'm a slave to Christ. So what I'm trying to say is self-reliance is the antithesis of a lot of what the Bible is about and what it means to be a Christian. So my personal independence, my self-reliance, if I'm Adam and Eve and saying, I'm going to eat this and become like God, at the core of a lot of sin is this self-reliance. 
And that's why it's so hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. We'll get into that scripture later. But a rich man, the reason why it's hard, it's not impossible, not all rich people are doomed, depending on how you define rich. We are all very rich in this room. So it doesn't mean we're doomed. It just means it's a lot harder to rely on a savior when I can cover my own needs. So that's what we want to explore today, a lot of this concept. So if we rewind and look at what you guys had said when I asked about treasure day one, Bree, you talked about where your treasure is, your heart will be also, which we meditated on that scripture as homework, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Your stuff's going to leave, but there's this eternal treasure idea. Manisha, you talked about resources, so not just money, paper, but you talked about networking. We do have resources and, and value, and who do you know? Anything that you have attached that is attached to value. I liked that kind of explanation. And I think today we'll kind of cover the grounds in a lot of that. If you look at tithes, sacrifices, for us, I think when I've read a lot about the Bible sacrifices, I'm looking at what seems to be animal brutality, <laughs> killing something. But I don't often see the inherent value financially associated with a bull versus a lamb versus, you know, if they can't afford a lamb for certain things, it said bring a turtle dove or a pigeon, <laughs> right? There were these different sacrifices, even for people who are poor, but I rarely think of these sacrifices that happen day in, day out as like monetary value because our culture is so much money focused dollars, bitcoins. No. <laughs> right? So, um, and Manisha, you even talked about your home, right? You can bring people into that, your car, right? When did you find someone at work that commuted? And if you're in the same neighborhood, offered a, you know, like that's our treasure that we can share. Angela, you talked about heirlooms and antiques, things passed down, there's objects, there's significance, that's treasure when we talked about this concept of treasure. Chris, you had talked about treasure depends a lot on where you are. Certain things have value in certain places, in certain circumstances. I love your analogy of you might treasure a bot of water in the desert. <laughs> if you look at Esau, what did he treasure when he came back from a hunt starving he sold his birthright for stew <laughs> and it's kind of like well that seems kind of stupid but in that moment you know our, our our i think an interesting thing that we may dive deep into it today we might not but one thing similar to how time is not just literal hours but our perception and experience of time that changes everything Treasure has a very perception to it, too, where, like, certain people value certain things more than others, right? There's, you can assess, people will spend all kinds of money for certain priorities, right? For some people, a brand name that gives a certain element of who they are that's worth lots of money. A Lamborghini, which is rather, ugh. I mean, I haven't, I've wanted to drive them, but I did rent a convertible Corvette that had a mid-engine, so it was like the same kind of supercar, and I drove up the 101 freeway, felt all cool. Ugh, my back, I was like, this car, when I was done, I was like, I can't wait to get my Subaru Forester because it's so much easier to drive, you know? <laughs> that thing was cool and exciting, but it's like, if I thought about actually owning that car, my priorities for me, I, I was grateful I took away, like, hey, I don't know if that would be worth the money for what that represents. 
So I think it's an interesting concept when we talk about treasure, is this concept that money, stuff, we, if, if, if we can just look at this room and compare what you value versus what Chris values and how much if we took your budget and what you spent on, some of us, hundreds of dollars on food. We like to eat out, we drink nice drinks, fine, fine dining, blowing money away on that. Hey, there's plenty of people, that's what they care about. Others, <laughs> they shop at Costco, they buy in bulk, they just want to buy as cheaply and simply as possible and spend their money on vacations and trips. And, you know, I, I, I remember it blew my mind when I first, I never thought of it this way, but I've traveled a lot in my life. And someone in the church came up to me and guessed how much money I made because he's like, I just watch your Instagram profile and I can assume how much. The, and I was like, that's where all my money's going. <laughs> I was like, I'd never really thought of like, oh, yeah, plane tickets and all these things. So for me, a lot of my priority, I sometimes look at my life and be like, oh, I, what if I was a homeowner by now? That would be a different sense of security and priority, but I've had to sacrifice a lot of these sort of experiences and travel and things I've done. So again, if we can see and agree on that, then how can our priorities change when we come under the authority of God's idea of provision and security? So let's discuss this scripture. Um, and I'm curious if any of you guys, like I suggested, read the whole chapter of Matthew 6. Anyone try it? We'll look at it more today if you didn't, regardless. <laughs> but uh, I'll read it, and I want to invite your, your discussion, things you took away, things you noticed, and then I, I do want to kind of break down the bigger picture of where we are in the Bible. But yes, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy or where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also i want to get your feedback but just some things here as i was studying this more it was interesting looking at the word for rust it also connected in the greek with like eating you know rust kind of eats away at metal but there was this like consuming things getting consumed, um, the laying up, the storing up. It's not just gaining stuff, it's accumulating. So again, there's a difference between having treasure and accumulating, right? We have this story or this parable about the guy that built the bigger barns. You guys remember that story? He's like, I have so, my, my crop did so well. I'm what do I do? And he's like, he went and built a bigger barn. And then I think the, the parable says, what a foolish man. His life was required from him that night. <laughs> it's like he built a big barn for nothing. You know, so this is the laying up, the storing up that we're talking about. It's not, this isn't saying don't eat, don't feed yourself. It's the excess, the storing. And then the heart is the other thing. Right, if you look at um, the concept of the heart, we, we have to realize our perception and what we mean by that word is different than what the Greeks and people using that word when they wrote the Bible would have used. Um, but it's the seat and center of human life. It's this seat of desires, feelings, and affections. So it is pretty similar to the way we use heart. But desires affections, feelings. So, what do you guys think? Thoughts about this scripture? Just 
makes life meaningful. All the treasures of this world that sucks it all about, and it doesn't, it doesn't last in any value that you can't give it away. And then I think of all the stories I hear about old, like older people maybe feeling almost on the brink of death themselves and reflecting back on what they what they remember in life, what they felt worthy. I really wish I spent more time in the office, is what they all say, right? Yeah. Fleeting. Yeah. Spend some time in Ecclesiastes, right? It's fleeting. Yeah. Thanks, Angela. Others? Yeah. It's an internal investment. Yeah. That's what people, that's how I thought about that. Internal. internal investment, yeah. And there's a conversion. If you've ever traveled overseas and you've taken the dollar and tried to get some other form of currency, I grew up with this understanding growing up in the Philippines that we were always aware of how much the dollar was worth because my parents got paid technically in dollars and then converted it. And sometimes when the economy in the Philippines was bad, we had a lot of money because... <laughs> Every single dollar, in my, just in my childhood, I remember when the dollar was worth 40-something pesos, and then when it was worth 55, like, 10, like a 10%, 55 pesos versus 40, that goes a big difference per dollar, right? <laughs> so what's interesting about this, right, is like you said, Bree, you can lay up treasures on earth, but you can also like go to the money changer, right? And how can I trade these treasures on earth for an eternal treasure? So again, a house, you can't take it with you, but you could use your house to win souls, to have an impact on an eternal, you know, something eternally, right? If you look at the, the movie Blind Side, it's always a fun one because it's so popular and people have seen it, but like you just think about this, Taco Bell franchise owning family that had a big fancy house and pick up this young man basically homeless and come stay on our couch, right? More than enough space and the impact it had on that life long term. Um, again, that's just an example from a movie that we can all look at, but we can get creative and instead of storing up like the man with the barns, man, I have so much grain, what do I do with it? The world says, let's build another barn so we could store more. That would give us a bigger sense of security. But maybe a heavenly perspective is like, how could I convert this excess, this stored up, this laid up, to something that actually has value eternally? Manisha, Chris? You mean like God's kingdom type, like the purpose, our lives are for other people? Yeah, because other people translate into souls. Yeah. So like you use your tangible thing to, as almost like, I don't know, funneling? Message. Yeah, for connecting with others. Mm.
Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating because a lot of what both Bree and you got into was what do we mean by treasures in heaven? <laughs> and you could try to study what that would mean throughout the Bible or what Jesus might be referring to here. But yeah, a big part of it, I would agree, if based on the Bible, a lot of what has eternal value would be souls, right? Um, other people, impact and relationships. Chris? <laughs> I got nothing. Like what I was going to talk about instead of instead of like laying for treasures on earth where like rust and and moss and stuff have to be destroyed, like that's the thing that's it's using your treasures to buy stuff. But like what what about like using your treasures to Yeah. Talents, right? Like, um, investing in them is that in the same realm as as like as this, where like well, I don't know if Jesus is giving a lesson on investing here, but it's a similar concept in in, in understanding what actually has value. And if you get into the weeds of the financial literacy stuff around assets versus liabilities, right? A liability is something that's going to cost you money in the long run and doesn't really, again, if we're trying to find what is valuable, a liability isn't because it costs you money. An asset would be something that would make you more money. So that's really valuable. So it's a similar thing here where, where Jesus is saying, Earthly treasures, not valuable, waste away. Heavenly treasures, valuable, don't waste away. I think something, as you were <laughs> talking, Chris, because we've known each other a while, I think something you probably have a lot of experience in is how your house and a lot of the fixing and things you've had to do over it, you've experienced this moth and rust, <laughs> right? Like, I feel like over the years in, in Bible studies, it's like, oh, here's this other thing that happened to your house, and here's the contractor that screwed it up, and then it cost more money, and then it made it worse. And again, as someone who doesn't own a home, I can look at you and be like, oh, I want that. And then I <laughs> go to Bible study, and you share your prayer request, and it's like, do I want that? You know, it's like, that's the thing here, right? It's like, a house, awesome, sounds cool, but this is an inescapable reality. And moth and rust are just illustrations, but again, houses, cars, there are things that happen to them that I think there's a part of our soul that just gets frustrated and hurt, where it's like, can I just... Or like, I get a nice new white shirt, and the moment I wear it out to dinner, pfft, you know, it's like, no, right? <laughs> like, things on earth just kind of get screwed up and messed up and broken. And I know every time, like, this iPad right here, I remember very clearly when this crack right there happened. And I think I had a screen protector, I think... I had a screen protector and I was like, oh good, it's just a screen protector. I lifted up the screen protector, I was like, <gasps> how did the screen protector not crack? And then my actual iPad crack. And this was new when it was iPad Air. It was such an exciting thin thing. Like compared to the stuff we have now, this is lame. But I remember how disappointed I was that this crack right here. And now I'm this was like 2014, 2015. It's 10 years. Hey, I, it's still useful for some things. This crack hasn't really destroyed it. But again, we, we deal with that. You buy a new phone and I was like, oh, I dropped it or 
all of this stuff, there's just this, whenever you're in that game and your value is there, it sucks. But yes, I think if you're looking through the, the illustration of um, investing principles, it's taking that, expanding it even bigger to things that are even more worthwhile. It's the same logic. But uh, um, I do think, oh, one last thing, Manisha. I do think, you know, and we'll talk about this more if you look at some scriptures that are like, oh, should I just go sell everything and give to the poor, right? Like, that's not always wisdom. Do I invest so that I will lay up treasures for yourself, for myself? That's not aligned with God's wisdom, right? It's the same investing wisdom, but if it's laying up for myself, not aligned with God's wisdom. But if I'm laying up, there's some, you know, one of, my, uh, one of the missionaries I support that is a high school friend of mine, his whole mission, he's in the Philippines and he's partnering with pastors and churches and he's equipping them with business and financial skills. So over there, really common, this idea of a tricycle, a motorbike with a side carriage, drives people around. So he'll raise money from America, buy a tricycle, give it to the church, equip the pastor so they own this asset, and one of the church members gets to drive it as their job, and then the church makes money and supports the pastor through this tricycle, which is theirs forever. And there's stories of churches that they did well with that money and then they bought another one and then was able to plant a church. Because especially if you're looking in impoverished communities with small congregations, you're not gonna be able to support a pastor. But that's a method that uses wise earthly investment principles to forward God's kingdom. So if you do have means, and you invest it, that's a good thing. But is it for yourself or using that wisdom to grow the kingdom? So I saw two hands, Manisha and Bree. Yeah, I don't know if you ever thought of it this way, but I've thought of this. We, we have a different level of capacity for responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, money, in a way, equates with responsibility. And there's a capacity for power. And, and it, what I mean by capacity, you can give a lot of power to any person. But if you give power to someone that doesn't have the capacity, they're going to abuse it. They're not going to use it well, right? It's like you allow someone to drive a car that really doesn't know what they're doing. They could hurt and kill a lot of people with that power. Money is similar, and we see a lot of young people, um, primarily in the fame and entertainment industry, that get a lot of money before they have a capacity for it. And I think, for me, sometimes I, uh, why, why haven't I... You know, you look at these overnight successes. Why haven't I struck gold or made it yet? You know, made it. And sometimes I realize, like, in God's economy, how about my character? Has he equipped me with the capacity? And part of the way I've seen God in my life, I've noticed things with growing up as a missionary kid, going out as a missionary, where God's like equipping me with some of these financial skills where it gives me confidence 
if that were to be a future reality, I would hope I'd have the capacity to manage that money well and not frivolously use all that money. So I think, yeah, investing in yourself, knowledge, wisdom gives you the capacity because money is one of those things that uh, um, <laughs> I've heard, heard people talk about how money can make people evil. And I don't think money will change your character. It'll just make you more of who you are. And unfortunately, a lot of us don't have a strong foundation. And if we just had a whole lot of money tomorrow, it would be more of the worst of us, <laughs> right? And some people like, you don't necessarily want more money because it multiplies certain aspects of you and makes things more, so anyways, not to go down that too much, but yeah, investing in knowledge and wisdom and, and when you seek God, he often is working on your sanctification. That's his goal, your character, making you more like Jesus which would be a better steward of money. So, again, take something like going to impact. I wrestled with impact. You asked me this question last year or last week. And I was like, I need to work on my career. I don't want to get behind. But God showed me that, like, don't work, <laughs> spend money, go to this school for a year and seek me. And what he did was he worked on my character and equipped me in a way that I'm confident that the successes I've had in my career since, I owe a lot to the way that my character was changed in that season. Different priorities. Um, Brie? I don't know, I was just gonna say, I mean, just kind of similar things, like when you, if God's away, then you're like, oh, like, I always feel like I wanna just like build something. So we, we went to, We spent a certain amount of money, and then when we bought our home, like the Lord literally, it was at the time during COVID, like things were going up like 100,000, 150,000 or whatever. Our asking price, oh, we got the house, but it's selling price, that same amount that we spent, like, spent building the church under asking price. Wow. So the exact same amount, you know? And so we didn't go and do and build this church because we thought we were going to get something from it. We yeah. Did Provided. That amount. Yeah. I mean, if he does those kind of things when you're obedient to what he, not, I mean, that's not talking about everybody, but also, like, I was just reading, like, when you're talking about your health, and, like, um, it says um, in Matthew 10, 11 through 14, when you enter a city or town, find someone worthy, person there, and stay in that home until you leave. When you enter a home, say, peace be with you. If the people there welcome you, let your peace stay there. It's interesting that you bring that scripture up. I don't know if you guys ever thought about going and staying with the first person that showed you generosity in the context of what they were doing. So these were Jesus sending out his disciples to go and spread the gospel. And if you imagine them going into a town, these nobodies, poor fishermen, and they're not educated men, who are the people that are going to invite them in? not usually the proud and <laughs> well provided for people but now they start sharing the gospel and gaining a following and people are coming to christ and and wanting more of this who do you think they're going to get invitations from to come over to my house right the powerful and the people that have bigger homes so there's kind of an interesting lesson in that 
those instructions from Jesus is like, don't follow what the world would define as a better place. Oh, we're staying in the bedroom with this family's, you know, kids, you know, like that we're just sharing a room. And then this other guy that's got not only a spare bedroom, but a spare bedroom for each of us disciples is inviting us to stay there. Lord, I think you're calling us to go to this house, right? And Jesus is saying, no, stay with those that were actually generous, not the ones that became generous because they saw what they could gain from you, right? So again, that's speaking into that underlying difference in economy. So if you probably noticed throughout this class, I've, I've gone more and more into scripture <laughs> in each and every class. I don't know, God's just been working on, like, there's enough in here to talk about, to learn from. So if you want to pull out your Bibles, I wanted to actually do that aspect of, if we look at what we just looked at here, Matthew, um, this is chapter 6, 19 through 21. It's kind of in the middle of what famous, probably most famous speech in all of the world. Jesus's speech that we call the Sermon on the Mount. So it starts chapter 5, ends in chapter 7. This is kind of in the middle. I, didn't, I haven't spent a lot of time in the Sermon on the Mount, but you could kind of teach this whole class basically from the Sermon on the Mount. A lot of this is backwards thinking, right? God's kingdom thinking. And if you look at a lot of chapter 5, right, it shows how different it means to be blessed in the kingdom of heaven. So if you pulled up chapter 5, you'd see, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Right? Blessed who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness snake. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil and f- against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is the reward in heaven. When you're per- so for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Then chapter 5 gets into salt and light. A lot of what we've talked about this entire series is this idea of being so different. (laughs) Our perspective, it's like saltiness. Those Christians, there's a a flavor about them that's unique and different, that light on a hill, all that stands out in a dark and sinful world. But if we look at chapter 6, Um, Depending on what Bible you have, you'll have some different headings, and it can read it for you too if you'd like. (laughs) But uh, um, I'm not going to read all of the chapter six, but if you just look at what's around that passage, right? It talks about doing good and don't do charitable, it doesn't say don't do any charitable deeds, but it talks about the heart, right? Don't do it to be seen right? That's what the hypocrites do. They play the trumpets and do it in the streets. But don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. It speaks a lot to the treasure, right? Where it's like, why are we giving? Then it talks about prayer. And don't pray eloquent prayers in the synagogues in front of people. Go in your room and pray. Then we have the, um, uh, the Lord's Prayer, which right in you know, verse 10 says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? On earth as it is in heaven could be another title for this course. That's what we're trying to do, bring heaven on earth. Then it talks about fasting, and are you doing fasting to show off and be sad, or is it for God? So you can see, like, on a heart level, there's a connection between all these thoughts, isn't there? Even in chapter 5, between blessed are the meek, the poor in spirit. Then it gets to this, after fasting, don't lay up treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven. And it almost relates. Like, if you look at this whole idea of um, doing good to please God, if you go to chapter 6, verses 6 through, or sorry, 1 through 4, It says, take heed that you do not do terrible deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. 
Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound the trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. This is the powerful part. Assuredly, I say you, they have their reward. So what's that saying? They're doing it to gain that attention from men. And Jesus is telling them, that's it. There you go. That's your reward. We looked at this investment principle. We talked about Esau trading birthright for a, a, a bowl of stew. You think about how fickle people's opinions are. Fickle the attention of man. Fame, fortune. Like, do we realize just how fleeting that is? And Jesus is giving, and he does this in everything from the, the, the charitable giving to the prayer to the fasting. He says, assuredly, I tell you, they have their reward. It's like, that's it. That's the totality of your reward. So if you want that, if that's worth it for you, go do it on the street corners and in the synagogues and blow the trumpet. You're not going to get anything from me. <laughs> it's an either or, right? We can either choose to do it. God, man looks at the outward. God looks at the heart. We can play this game on earth to get the attention of man and get what the world says we should want the fame, the fortune, doesn't mean we're not going to become famous in the process or gain wealth in the process, but if we're doing it for that, God says, that's your reward. If you look at the uh, entertainers and famous people that committed suicide because they were alone and depressed, that shows you how fleeting that earthly reward is. The people that we would think should have the most friends and should have the most attention are the ones that are killing themselves over their lack of attention. Yeah, no real relationship. It doesn't mean you can't be a famous person and not have real relationships, but I think what Jesus is saying here is really true. If that's why you're doing it, I'm going to give you that reward. If you're doing it, for the sake of doing it, you're being charitable, you're praying, you're fasting for, for that, then you'll get treasures in heaven. So then we have these, again, we've, we've seen this theme of treasures in heaven, and then we get the scripture. So see how Jesus has built up to that, and this is intertwined to all of this Sermon on the Mount, heaven on earth thinking. Then we have this idea of the lamp of the body. How did the scripture end? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What does that mean? We could teach the class on just that. But again, heart, the word that we're reading here in the Greek, talks about the seat of your desires, feelings, and affections. Where your desires, feelings, or where your treasure is, that's where your desires, feelings, and affections will be also. What's that mean? So again, where our treasure is, what we're laying up, whether it's on earth or in heaven, that's where our desire, our affection will be. So all of our affection, our desire, these feelings will be resting on wherever our treasure is. So again, if what I find my value in, my treasure, is on these fleeting things of the world, what happens to my feelings, desires, and affections? This is what a lot of us feel the roller coaster of living on earth. What's different about eternal, unchanging treasure, right? You ever heard that your problems are inversely proportional to the size of your perspective? Inversely proportional makes it sound very complicated. But you have a problem, 
the, the size of your problem inversely proportional. So bigger problem, smaller perspective. Smaller problem, bigger perspective. So inverse, you guys get that? So let's take a problem. <laughs> you get a flat tire. What perspective can we look at that flat tire through? If it's my commute to work and I'm gonna be late, how big of a problem is that flat tire? It's a small perspective, much bigger problem. In the scope of your year, <laughs> that flat tire, five years from now, are you talking about the flat tires you had? Is that a big problem in your life? Is that <laughs> life altering? No. If you choose a bigger perspective, we have smaller problems. When you said like think about like that flat tire becomes a bigger perspective, okay, I got this flat tire. Maybe the guy who's coming to pick me up needs like love and there's Jesus or whatever. Yeah. So maybe I got that flat tire because there's somebody who is you know gonna have to help me and they need something. You know? like, That's a different perspective, right? Yeah. One's a, a self focused perspective, one's an others focused perspective. Right? Um, if you're coming on Wednesday nights and listening to George talk about Philippians, he talks about his suffering in Philippians chapter 1 as for good because he was introduced to people in the prison that never would have heard about Christ. And he's, <laughs> he sounds crazy, but he's like, this is so great. All, I've, I've been able to win over all of these prisoners and, and guards. And he sees his hardship as an opportunity for other people. His perspective is different. So again, if we talk about eternity, this idea of treasures in heaven, Jesus is giving us a different perspective here in which to look on our earthly problems. Heavenly treasure, desires, feelings, if we put it on this big picture stuff, we don't really waver over the small stuff. And stuff that we think is a big stuff. You ever know someone that they're going through some pretty big stuff and it doesn't seem to shake them? They probably have a pretty big perspective. So again, we get to decide where we're going to put those feelings and um, desires and affections. And it's based on where we have our treasure. So if you choose to put your treasure into something, that's where your heart's going to follow. So if you live your life treasuring fame, fortune, attention, that's where all of your emotions are going to be. That's why these different idols are so empty. You will, like we talked about in the first class, anything you worship that's not God will eat you alive. That quote, right? It's like, if I'm seeking that thing, that's where all of my heart will be. And that thing is empty. So Jesus is inviting us, put your treasure in something that's actually worthwhile, permanent, eternal. And then once we pass that passage, we get into the lamp of the body. It says, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, if the eye is good, the whole body is full of light. If the eye is bad, the whole body is full of darkness. It's this kind of idea of like, what are we allowing into us? And it impacts what's inside of us. Then you have verses 24, or verse 24, you cannot serve two masters. Either you'll hate one or love the other, or else he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. <laughs> we have another money one. And then we get to one of my favorite sections, verses 25 through 34. I will read this for us because it's so good. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life what you will eat, what you will drink, nor your body, and what you'll put on. Is not your life more than food and your body more than clothing? Again, food and clothing are both treasures, physical stuff. Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap or gather into barns. Again, this gathering, <laughs> storing up. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? 
or one hour to his life, right? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is um, here today and gone tomorrow, or thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. That's another way of saying the world seeks after this. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first, what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. <clears throat> Which I have found to be very true. Each day in my life tends to have its own trouble. And that's enough for me. When I start compiling tomorrow's trouble on today, ugh, it's unbearable. If you start compiling to next year's trouble on today, ugh. <clears throat> so again, this whole concept of storing up, laying up the, the barns, right? <clears throat> Versus this whole do not worry section is about God is providing each day. You look at how God provided in the wilderness with manna. Go out, collect for today. If you store it tonight, it's going to get worms and go bad tomorrow. He was training them to be like, I'm only going to get enough for today. Give us today our daily bread was in the prayer earlier in the chapter, right? And I won't get into chapter seven, but you see how a lot of all that we've talked about, time, talent, treasure, these themes are all interwoven into just how Jesus talks about the world. And money is a big deal to God. Money is mentioned 2,000 times in Scripture. There are 27 parables on money. That's a fourth of the total parables. It's a big deal. Um, if you were here on the uh, budget Sunday, Aaron, I like the way he put this in his PowerPoint, but he said, God can accomplish his means by any way he pleases. But humans, especially modern culture, we use money, <laughs> right? So God uses money to partner with us because that's our economy. But not, money is nothing more than a tool, and it's a tool invented by humans we're the ones that give it its value. That's part of this bigger um, economic system. But <clears throat> like every tool we have in life, whether it's our time, our talent, or treasure, we can choose to use that tool in partnership with God or not. So why is money so important? Well, don't you know it says money is the root of all evil. You ever hear someone say that? misquote the Bible. It's not what it says. I've literally seen people on like TV say, oh, the Bible says the money is the root of all evil. <laughs> it's a very simple misquote. What does it say? The love of money. Okay, so let's discuss this. What's the difference between money being evil and the love of money? What do we think the love of money means? Hurt others to get it, do anything to get it. That's what you do when you love it. Idolatry. Idolatry. So what, idolatry is a great Christianese word. Go talk to someone over across the street about idolatry. Do they know what in the world you're talking about? American idol, what idol? So I like uh, Tim Keller's definition where if you ever want to dive deep into idolatry, I like his book, Counterfeit Gods. And it goes into even what the ancient gods like Molech and Asheroth and all these gods we read about in the Old Testament, what they represent, and we see how we do it nowadays. I remember Scott explaining this when I had a class with Scott. Molech 
was the god um, of abundance. It was that like a fertility um, crop that was their abundance at the time. And a Molech statue was its arms, it was a furnace, and the arms were out, and you would place your baby on the arms, and it would roll into the mouth, into the furnace. It was how they worshipped, and the Canaanites would do child sacrifice. So we see this connection with this, this idol of abundance, money, crops, and child sacrifice. How do we see this show up in our life? How many parents have sacrificed their children at the altar of their own success? What are all the arguments about why I should abort a baby? I'm not ready for that. I'm not that kind of commitment that impedes my life. So the same type of sin, worshiping a similar idol, right? If we use the label Molech, <laughs> don't make any sense, right? So idolatry is when a good thing, money's great, good thing, becomes the best thing or the only thing. But the only thing, the best thing is God. So anything above God, when anything other than God becomes the best thing, idolatry. So love of money, idolatry, seeking it. Any other comments on what it means to love money, why that would be the root of evil? What would be an example? Anyone that you think has loved money that has caused all kinds of evil because of their love for money? So remember when we talked about protein powders, and I told you to remind me about the pea proteins. <laughs> what were you saying about the pea proteins from China, Chris? That they were selling them for stupidly for low prices, and they were saying that they were organic. Mm -hmm. They were saying they were organic, but were they? Yeah. Why would someone claim to be organic? They could charge more, mm -hmm. but they're not. They love money. You just look at factory farms. You look at, what was that? Mad cow disease when they fed meat to cows, right? You look at all of these documentaries about our food system and we see how we keep trying to cheat the process. We try to get more out of less. We try to get the cows to their weight quicker so we feed them corn, which gives them ulcers and actually kills the cow. You ever heard that stat that like, they slaughter cows at a certain amount of days old. And if you let them live another 50 days, they would have died from natural causes because we're feeding things that kill them. Because we're trying to, the love of money is causing this prevailing evil throughout our world. A lot of these social problems we look at, what, what was sex trafficking? What's that thing about? <laughs> why, why would you go into a poor community kidnap a child love of money that's one thing I, I struggle with sometimes is like the whole like idea of capitalism and like how yeah. our you know our world our world in the united states can be like worship it uh, like this even sometimes with business yeah you know, Yep. To get people to do, yep. To pay for things. Yep. And it's just, uh, for me, it's just, it's just very icky sometimes. And sometimes it makes me want to just like, I don't want to participate in any of it, you know? Because, um, yeah, business a lot of times is, is a part of that whole taking it. Yeah, and, and just products and services. And we're always like trying to sell people. And like, you need this product. Yeah. I mean, you look at like our energy issues right now and electric cars and they were like, electric cars, good for the environment. And now they're like, electric cars, batteries and chemicals, more carbon in the crate. You know, it's like, again, 
what is, what is truth? Do you know our food pyramid? You ever see that thing? <laughs> you know how that thing was designed <laughs> with the grains on the bottom? That's because that's what our farms here in America produced. You know, the, the companies that were making money off food created science that proved that we needed to buy the food they sold, even though now we've proven that that food is bad for you. Again, the love of money creates all sorts of pervasive evil. And yeah, the more we're acquainted with God's view, the more you'll discern it. But just realize being in the world and of the world, it's like the fish thinking it's wet, right? You're swimming in it. And that's the struggle, especially people that get saved, start reading the Bible. Or, uh, Aaron shared on Sunday when he was teaching, he talked about his testimony and starting a marijuana company. And he's like, our shareholders were relying on me to sell as much marijuana as I possibly could. That was the definition of his job as a CEO of a marijuana tech company. He's like, this doesn't align with what I now believe as a Christian. I don't think that's the best way. And he left his job. It's a dramatic testimony, and we have a podcast on it. It's really powerful the way he says it. But again, yeah, there's a lot of conflict in it. So if we pursue money, it will literally kill you. You ever hear the lo- more money, more problems? Think about the, the wealthy people whose children are kidnapped. They no longer have safety because they have pursued money with their life. And they have to spend more money to have bodyguards and all these other things. And your children tend to have tremendous difficulty. It's very hard to raise a kid well, not when you have means, but when you have means that you and I can't even comprehend means, that's, if you pursue it, it will cause evil, right? Every major power leader has always taken advantage of the people below them. Humans are terrible saviors. Anytime someone has so much power, they have always taken advantage. Again, it's not about Hitler versus Stalin versus Mao Zedong versus whoever you point out versus even the ones that were decent leaders. Every single one of them have taken advantage of the people below them. It's very rare for a leader to protect those below them. If you want as much money as you possibly can now, it's going to require taking advantage of others, right? If you look at Egypt, what we talked about before, I've given the example of Egypt, they had storehouse cities because they had so much abundance, these pyramids, right? And how were they able to accomplish that? They had a whole civilization of people that were slaves. There's no way to do that fairly. Humans can't have that level of abundance fairly, right? Pursuing that is going to cause some kind of destruction. Now, I'm not saying that anyone in this world that has an abundance, name any billionaire, is clearly destroying the lives of other people. No. But try to get there now. <laughs> try to get as much money as quickly as possible, and you'll find it's really hard to do it in a way that doesn't cheat or hurt or take advantage of other people. Even if you look at, uh, um, (laughs) I heard this thing. (laughs) I don't want to get into local news. But you know all the floods we had? Apparently they did cloud seeding. You know what cloud seeding is? They flew up planes into clouds and released these chemicals to cause it to rain. They've done that in Dubai for a long time, but apparently they just did it here in California. And people have known this technology for years. And then (laughs) we have the floods that we've had recently. And why would someone cloud seed? Water creates wealth. They need water for stuff. So again, I don't want to get into the reality of that accusation or that news, but it just connects to the fact that like, okay, I want to do this thing to provide water so that I can farm my crops and make more money. And there's all these unnecessary damage and destruction that can come out of it. And it did happen like in the middle of like the poor areas, poor areas of San Diego. Yep. It wasn't like, you know, 
Well, the reality is like, yeah, the, the poor, poor people are disadvantaged to, you know, if you look at the Philippines, typhoons happen all the time. The poorest people are the ones that are most affected by the typhoons because they have the, the least means to protect themselves. Every time a typhoon goes by, it wipes out the entire poor village and they start over. The wealthy are the only ones that have that ability. So again, the... Yeah. Yeah. But again, if we look at the heavenly perspective, you talked about don't store up treasures on earth, heavenly treasures. How did you define heavenly treasures? People, right? So if we're living by that economy, how do we help the poor? If everyone's living by that economy, there's enough. Do you know how, much, how many tons of food we throw away each year? We have enough food to feed the world. We just don't use it appropriately. Right? And people, for the love of money, go to these exceptionally expensive, you know, like, just go on some thought experiments. And you will see how the love of money is the root of all evil. The Bible, though, talks about having no partiality justice <laughs> those less fortunate than you so if we're talking about this love of money i'm going to read the passage that's from this is from first timothy chapter six we're going to start in verse six verse 10 is the good one so now godliness with contentment is great gain powerful statement for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we will carry nothing out. <laughs> Just like Matthew's. Um, and having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. Again, desire to be rich. There's a key word, way that's phrased. They fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. <laughs> Strong language. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through many sorrows. I like that image. They have pierced themselves through many sorrows. And you look at these people that have pursued wealth and you'll see this pattern of piercing themselves with many sorrows. There we go. Disappeared for a second. So keep reading. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue what? Righteousness, godliness, faith, patience, gentleness, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, to which you are also called and have confessed good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is based and only pontiff... Oh. That's a word I don't know how to pronounce. Pontitate. The King of kings and lords of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, and to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. And then it continues to talk more about money. Command those who are rich in the present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches. Riches are uncertain. But, don't trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, 
that may, they may lay hold of eternal life. You know how cheap a sunset is? Right? He gives richly all things to enjoy. But we stress out that we can't go to that dinner. <laughs> so are we greedy or godly? Right? Wealth does not equal greed. Money does not equal evil. Not everyone needs to give everything away. But this materialism, commercialism, these things are the dangers. So what does the Bible do? What are some of the solutions? Again, we've got a lot of this in Scripture thus far, but everything in the Bible and money is designed to give us freedom. It trains our trust muscles. The way that we see examples of how to use our money is all about trust. If I'm fully providing for myself, do I need to trust? Right? If I'm flying in on a flight next Monday evening and I ask Bree, hey, can you pick me up at the airport? I have to trust her or else I'm stuck. If I just reserve an Uber and pay for it, I don't need to trust anybody. And our world has made it very easy not to have to trust in anything and to be the king of my own creation and rule my kingdom. But if you look at how the Bible talks about what we do with our money, it creates and it stretches the trust because it's much easier and more convenient for me to just get an Uber. But if I wanted to grow my trust muscles, I would ask a friend to pick me up. Again, not the perfect illustration, but hopefully you're getting the point. So Matthew 19, 23 to 26, we talked about the rich man and the kingdom of heaven, but I want to read the couple verses around it. Then Jesus said to his disciples, again, this is after he sent that rich young man away. If you remember the story, he said, I've done all these things, God, what else must I do? And he says, sell all your possessions and give to the poor. That's not a command for all of us to do. But Jesus was getting at his heart. And we don't know what he did. It's just he said he went away sad. So what does Jesus then do? Turning to his disciples, he says, Assuredly, I say, you, say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished. We've heard this a bunch of times, so it doesn't cause astonishment for us anymore, but it should. Who then can be saved? Because again, if your whole salvation is in money and security, and Jesus says, if you go that road, that's going to lead to death. It's hard to get in heaven if you go down that road. They're like, well, what do we do, Lord? Like, we were trained that that is our salvation. Jesus looked at him and said, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And again, through men's eyes, worshiping money is the only way. So just not to spend too much time on some of the Bible's commandments on money. We're probably familiar with the concept of tithe. I also mentioned first fruits when we're talking about time. But uh, in Exodus... When it's talking about first fruits, it says, you shall not delay to offer. It's not, don't delay, <laughs> don't delay, don't wait. You offer it first, right? The first fruit of the ripe produce, your juices, the firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. Likewise, the firstborn of your oxen or sheep. So basically, if you, if you read it, we don't have time to get deep into these Exodus, Leviticus type stuff. But if you look at the giving, we have this concept of a tithe, which means tenth which is a portion. We look at how Leviticus, or the Levites were. They were not given an inheritance. What was their inheritance? Their inheritance was the tithe of the rest of the people. So if you look at how things work, the function of the priesthood, the temple, how the community at large comes into contact with heaven, those people, those Levites, and if you look at even when they count the people of Israel, the Levites were like a tenth. <laughs> and they were the firstborn, right? Um, 
Well, I don't know about the tenth piece. Don't write that in your notes. But the, the, the Levites were given to God. Oh, actually, no. This is what it was. The number of Levites accounted for the total number of firstborn in all of Israel. So instead of him taking the firstborn and asking people's firstborn, he said, I'm going to take the Levites. They're mine. And what were the Levites' inheritance? They didn't get land or anything like that. They did get some cities and some stuff around the cities, but their primary inheritance in the promised land was the tithe of the people. And again, so the tithe is them bringing for the function of the Levites, who are the priests, which allow us to come in contact with heaven. So if you take some concept like that and you look at something like missions, people are going to save other people. They cannot go and make their own money there. Their visas won't even allow them to make money in that country. The only way they can go is if other people give to that. How does this happen? The function of the church? This can't happen without people being generous. So a lot of these principles in the way that the, the, the kingdom of heaven works on this earth, how it plays out, requires generosity. And again, the first fruit, as we talked about before, if I'm giving the first and again, it talks about, it gets into everything here. First of your fruits, your cattle, your sons. It's basically everything that you have, I want the first of it. And again, the significance of the first is if I have a field and it takes 10 days to harvest, right? And I, the first whole day I harvest this, if I'm going to bring a tithe, it's not let me wait and see what the total amount is, and then give from that, it's I give the first, because that requires trust. And again, if we don't learn trust, we're going to put our trust in something other than God, which is the sandy foundation that is uncertain. So to get a bit further in the missions piece, if you go to Philippians chapter 4, which is a great, there's so many tattoos that are just one verse out of this chapter. So much goodness here. But when I was raising funds to be a missionary, chapter 4 verse 17 stood out to me. But I'm going to read chapter, or verses 10 through 20. You'll recognize a lot of these. Philippians chapter 4. It says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now... At last, your care for me has flourished again. Um, though I surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. This is just talking about them not being able to see him. Now that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and how to abound, to be in need and have want, right? Um, everywhere that and in all things I have learned both in full, or to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Great verse. That's not about winning your track race, but about surviving and being content with what you have. Nevertheless, you have done well um, that you shared in my distress. Now, Philippians know also that from the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. He's basically, the Philippians are the only church that gave him money. And he's thanking them. And then verse 17, it says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. If you're thinking through the lens of Paul, who needed financial support at some points, although he worked his way, that was the only church that gave him, and he was thanking him. But he's not seeking the gift for himself. What is he seeking? The fruit that abounds to who? them. So we're looking through this lens, right? And I've talked to many missionaries about this and fundraising because this is what God showed me. 
when I was fundraising and thinking I was asking for money, that was very awkward and weird. It was all about me. But instead of inviting people to be a part of the good work God was doing through me and the mission, because there's fruit, eternal treasure that comes out of that, that's going to be added to their account, right? Because I, I can't go unless someone sends me. So when I'm going to raise support for a mission, I'm not saying I need the money. God's going to send me, if he really is sending me, God's going to send me regardless. Now you, Manisha, you could be a part of this and you could share in what we're going to do over there. And you could be blessed. Yeah, again, if I'm looking from an eternal perspective, I don't know who gets more of the blessing the missionary who physically goes or the person that they wouldn't be able to go without their support. And again, it's not a competition. We're not doing it for the blessing. But if there is some sort of reward and blessing, wouldn't it make sense that both are partakers in that blessing? So again, if we're looking at generosity, we might be looking through a faulty lens. The world looks, what's in it for me? And I can even use that scripture And teach that scripture about what's in it for you. (laughs) But again, if I'm going as a missionary, I'm looking through the lens of the other person. What's the fruit that's going to be at its their account from the work that I'm going to do? So I'm not asking for money. I'm just inviting who wants some fruit? Who wants to share in the goodness of the Lord? And again, if I'm making money, I should be looking out. Who wants to share in the goodness of the Lord? This money is not for me to lay up for myself. I'm getting creative of who I can help and serve and send. Because if you look at that water analogy, we talked about this other time, and it came out of Chris's example of like, water in the desert is really valuable. If I gave you each a gallon of water, and that was it, where would you want to bring that gallon of water? (laughs) To a society or a people that had flavored water, sparkling water, glass bottled water, an abundance of water, or a a people that had to hike miles to go get dirty water that was going to make them sick, but that's all they had access to. I'd probably bring my water there. How much is the dollar worth in America? Less and less every year. How much is the dollar worth overseas? How far can that dollar go? The water analogy is easy, but when we start talking about our own money, that That's my money, Peter. I don't really want to get that money somewhere else. You've seen it, building that school in Uganda, or the church in Uganda. The cost of building the church in Uganda is how much money you save to buy your home. (laughs) Right? Like, that statement alone is wild debris, right? Like, a church in Uganda is the money that you saved building your home based on economic changes. So our life, we get to participate in different type of fruit. If we lay up treasures for ourselves, that's our reward. And we're going to spend our life watching moth and rust decay. Same as pray in front of the people for their attention. Their attention is your reward. And you're not going to get a reward from me, Jesus says. (laughs) That's our choice. Or lay up treasures in heaven. Permanent, eternal treasures. I get to use that money as a free gift to me. Is it my money? No. (laughs) One of the big things when I was raising support, I had some student loan debt. I was like talking to my mentor. Can I get a side job? Because I don't want to pay for this student loan debt out of donors' money. That doesn't feel right. And I, I don't have time to get into that whole dilemma. But what he said to me is, like, because again, I was saying, I need to get a job to make my money to pay for my debt versus use their money to pay for my debt. And he says, why does that make it your money? And that's all he said. (laughs) That changed everything. Why do I think that me making this money makes it my money? What's interesting about the tithe given to the Levites is they were commanded to give a tithe of the tithe. So the same commandment given to people that made money from themselves doing 
their work in a job versus the Levites whose only inheritance was gaining the gifts from the other Israelites, they were required to give generously from that money too. It's all God's money. None of it's ours. You might get more talents than the other, but how we steward those at talents are up to us. And I'll end with this. Um, a lot of this is this false idol of security. A lot of our money is attached to a sense of security. And economies shift. There are rumors and people talking about what if the dollar is no more the, long, the primary currency in the world? I don't know if that's going to happen, but if it did, you know what would happen to people that have spent their life making dollars? <laughs> there would be a lot of loss, right? Their whole life of working really hard to get investment accounts and retirement accounts wiped out in an instant. So is that a stable, secure sense of security? No. So in order to face security in the outer world, which is an uncertain, insecure world, you must have a foundation of certainty in your inner world. And if you look at children and you study secure attachment and you watch little kids that are really anxious and they hold on to their parents versus kids that will go out and play and socialize, the, what empowers those kids? Anyone know childhood psychology? <laughs> empowers those kids. To, it's what? Yeah. So people that have a secure, strong relationship and stability in their home, those are the ones that go out away from their parents in freedom and security. So again, similarly, if we look at the instinctual psychology of a child, we can look at our own lives and think, if I want to have that courage and power to go out into the world in freedom, and peace, where does that come from? Is that from more money? No. That's from a deep, secure connection and bond with, you said their parents, our Heavenly Father, right? Where we understand that we have abundance and security and we can trust. How do I work those trust muscles? I give. The less I give, the more I train my hands to grip ever so tightly to my money. And it's like sand, right? It's just going to slip out of your fingers the harder you squeeze. But everything in the Bible that people say, oh, you know, churches just want me for my money. The church doesn't need your money. God doesn't need your money. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's the creator of the universe. Why does God guess, ask me to give then if he doesn't need my money? It's for you. Right? Sabbath is for man, not man for the Sabbath, right? When we talked about time. Giving is also for us because the more we give, we're training our hearts to let go and have peace and security, and trust. And there's no way to cheat it. I cannot trust you, Manisha, unless we are in an environment of conflict where I have to see your true colors. If I just see you here and there, and life is dandy, I don't know what you're really made of. If we go through some trauma, one of the things I love about Aaron Sullivan, we got mugged together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's a Marine, right? He's trained, and a guy comes up to him with a knife right here. He knows what to do. He could have taken the knife, taken that guy out, and I'm over here with a camera, clueless, and a guy comes behind me with a knife up here, right? And Aaron is like, if I take this guy out, What's going to happen to Peter over there? 
I didn't even know the guy was behind me. I literally saw two men walking up to us when I was filming the scene, and I was like, oh, they must be pedestrians. I was so clueless to the fact that we were in danger. And then when the guy's taking my camera and saying, give me the camera, I didn't even know I was getting mugged. I was like, is this a security guard? Am I in trouble? Why do you want my camera? And I'm like, I don't want to give you my camera. You know, and that's why I have a little stab wound right here because he goes, and I was like, because, you know, I watch the movies. He's not really going to hurt me, right? You think this, and then I just go, huh? And I realize I can trust Aaron because if he cared about himself, the guy took his phone, his wallet. I didn't even have my phone and wallet because we left it all at home because we knew that it was dangerous. But if Aaron cared about himself, he had the power to take that guy out that was mugging him so that his stuff wouldn't get taken. But he saw what could happen to me. So because of that situation, I trust Aaron a lot because of that extreme situation, right? If I just see Aaron at church and wave at him, I don't know, he seems like a cool guy but I have a foundation of trust with him because of that shared experience. So do you trust God? Do you just wave at him and come say hi at church? Or are you giving generously and Bree building a church in Uganda where God can be, guess what? The exact amount of money that you gave, I'm going to show you a discount on your house did that build trust in the Lord's provision? Could you have gained that trust if you weren't first generous? So generosity is not for God. He doesn't need your money. He needs your trust. And the last thing, I know I'm out of time, but I wanted to share out of John chapter 4 when this is after the story of the woman at the well. And the meanwhile, it says that chapter 4, verse 31 through 38, it says, In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? They're thinking in a physical lens. What does Jesus say? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And he just finished telling the woman at the well, right? What was that whole conversation about? I'll give you living water. You will never thirst. And she goes, how are you going to give me water? You don't even have a bucket. You can't go get it. We look through this physical lens and God says, hey, give to that person. Be generous. And we go, how? I don't even have enough money for myself. And again, we see throughout the Bible, there is other sustenance. There are other priorities that are actually more meaningful, that have eternal value. Treasures that that moth and rust don't decay and economies don't steal or housing markets don't crash. And that stuff is what's accessible through relationship with the Lord. So again, Jesus came to give us life and to have it abundantly. The thief came to still kill and destroy. And the gospel of the thief is what you hear in the world. Go out there, hustle, work while you're young, save up. Again, there is real wisdom in investing and things like that. I'm not saying it's all evil. But if that's the love of money you're pursuing to lay up for myself, you're, <laughs> you're drawing from an empty well, right? But God has abundance, infinity, and that's what we have access to with him.
So do we want to live a life and to close with that last scripture from last week, right? He called to the people. He called the people to himself and his disciples also. And he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, if we want to follow God, if we want to live under his kingdom, let him deny himself. Take up his cross, a symbol of sacrifice and death, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life, to save up for their retirement, to have an abundance, to build a second barn, will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me, my sake and the gospels, gives generously to the poor, (laughs) provides submissions, all these things, They will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses its soul? If where your treasure is, there your heart is also, right? You're going to lose that treasure. You're going to lose your heart. You're going to lose your soul. So what does it profit you? If all of your treasure, you gain the whole world, wealthiest person, at the expense of what? How much destruction do you cause to get that kind of wealth when abundance is provided for you? So let me close the whole series out in prayer. Hi, Father, thank you for this fun group that we've journeyed through over these weeks. We just thank you for how you've transformed all of our lives, um, how you've put things in my life specifically timely, um, in accordance with these different classes, and you're inviting us to take on a new lens for our life. Are we going to look at the world through the way the world has told us to look at it, that everyone else sees it, or are we going to be citizens of heaven? Are we going to live in a different kingdom under someone else's authority? Are we going to quest after independence and freedom and my kingdom, my security, my money? Or will we be a slave to you? Because your word says we're going to be a slave to something. It's either sin and death or it's you. And we just pray that we would learn the daily picking up of our cross and laying down our life. That we would be living sacrifices holy and pleasing to you. That this wouldn't just be this class, that we took some great notes and read some cool scriptures and then went back into the world and used that framework for all that we do, but that we would start practicing these rhythms in our time, that we would start using our gifts and our talents for other things, that we would start being generous and working our trust muscles with our money and resources. And I just pray that you open the storehouses of heaven, which are not that we're all going to get rich and wealthy, but that you're going to give us a level of abundance that doesn't make sense and a food that we do not know of, that you're going to nourish and provide for us in ways that we could have never imagined. Pray these things in your name. Amen. Yay.